In the period from 1870 through the first decades of the 20th century, about 1,300,000 Swedish nationals left their homeland, their farms and towns, their churches, their mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, and they sailed 4,000 miles across the Atlantic Ocean to settle in America. Most of them never returned. They gave children over to a new land, a new country. The Sweden that they left was an emerging modern industrial society, but it was guided by a traditional and communitarian culture where deep social ties bound people together within places and parishes and families of origin. They left a harmonious built environment and a land of spectacular natural beauty full of forests and meadows, rivers and lakes and rugged archipelagos reaching out into the Baltic Sea to the east and the North Atlantic to the west. If you go there, the sheer loveliness of this land could make you cry, and then it would make you wonder, why? Why would they ever leave? I guess the historians say they left to escape extreme economic hardship. They were drawn by the promise of inexpensive farmland across our upper Midwest from Minnesota to Montana. They were enticed by rumors of high-paying factory jobs in Chicago and, and dependable work as domestic servants for rich people in Minneapolis. They succumbed to advertisements of cheap cross-Atlantic fares made possible by the advent of massive steam-powered passenger ships. The railroad companies were offering package deals for whole families, including land transport to homesteads in the Midwestern prairies. But there were different reasons. Some of the Swedes were swept up in pietistic Christian revivals that rejected the liturgical formalism of the state Lutheran church. America, they said, would offer them freedom to worship God in their own personal way, guided only by the Bible and the Holy Spirit. Among all those thousands of Swedes who left their land in the late 19th century were two in particular, a couple named Maria and Johannes Swenson. Now they lived in the province of Dalsland. It's a remote region out by the Norwegian border to the west, just brimming with forests and lakes and farms. It's really beautiful there. They uh, had grown up on farms not very far from each other, uh, the Nilsons and the Swensons. And they were married, um, perhaps in this church on the edge of the lake, uh, Sora Lee, although another family story says they were married in Maria's parents' home. Uh, but they lived here, uh, probably in this house uh, that you see. Uh, by that time, they had three children. Johannes was a farmer. He was, a, a, according to legend, a very strong man who could pick up a plow on his shoulder or you know, rescue a goat who had fallen down somewhere. And um, they uh, had started a life together. Uh, Johannes was not only a farmer, but he was a devout Christian. And a, he read the Bible assiduously. He was part of the Lesere readers movement that started the pietistic uh, uh, free church movement in Sweden at that time. So the term for these lay preachers was coal porter. You know, I mean, not like coal porter, but coal porter. That's pretty cool. And then they got the fever, America fever, as it was called, and decided to leave. And uh, according to the family story, there was a gathering of family and friends on the lakeshore uh, on this day at Lake Storley, uh, the uh, Strand. And Johannes made a speech in which he said that um, he knew his own children would go to America uh, on their own in the fullness of time, and he did not want to be left at home as a sad old man in Sweden. So he and Maria decided that they would preemptively go to America, take their family, leave their own family behind, and start a, a new, new line, new roots, new seeds for the family in America. In this pull between the young and the old, they would choose the young. And so they sailed away and they never came back, left in about 1891. Johannes and Maria Swenson were my great grandparents. On my father's father's side, uh, my father's mother's people, the Matsons, also came from Sweden about that time. And so uh, I have my roots there, and I'd never been to Sweden, um, but I had the opportunity to visit there recently with my wife, Pam, whose family came from Norway, and so we went there as well. That's a whole other movie. Um, and we're happy to share with you some reflections and some images uh, from that wonderful trip. The barn that you see behind me, it didn't actually belong to my ancestor, but the land that it's built on was uh, uh, allegedly, or I hope, uh, believably, uh, the farm of the original Sven, the father of Johannes, uh, from whom the Swanson name comes, according to the 
patronymic naming system of the day. Um, the house is gone. The, the spot where it stood is wooded and overgrown if you go up there. And you know where to look because you have a distant Swedish cousin who tells you where to look. You'll find this kind of symmetrical depression in the earth. And there is the, the, the foundation wall. You can just sit down there, put your hand on it, which I did. I sat there for a few minutes and reflected and just let my imagination uh, run. And it was, a, it was a wonderful feeling of connection to that land and to my ancestors. And uh, just about an inch under the surface, I uh, uh, found with my probing fingers a roof tile. And I picked it up and put it in my pocket kind of surreptitiously. I probably violated several Swedish statutes by doing that. And I'd like to say to the Swedish authorities, if you'd like to make a complaint, uh, I would be happy to repatriate this artifact to Dalsland. But in the meantime, it's kind of cool to have this thing, you know, this object that connects me and probably sheltered our, our ancestors, you know, Sven himself. I've heard about Sweden all of my life. It was, uh, you know, the old country. It was this mythical place that the people before the aunties and grandpa and grandma came from. I'd never been there. Why not go? So, you know, a few emails later, I was in touch with a Swedish fellow about my age, just a couple of years older, from Örebro, a college town a couple hours drive from Stockholm. I had never heard of Leonard and Ingrid Jardine, and they never heard of me as far as I know, but it turns out that Leonard and I are third cousins. We share a common set of great-great-grandparents, Maria Lisa Anders' daughter and her husband, Niels Nielsen. Uh, Maria Lisa and Niels had several children born in the mid-19th century. Uh, uh, among them were two sisters, Anna and Maria, who both married local fellows named Johannes from local farms of the Andreasens and the Svensons, respectively. The latter, Johannes, succumbed to America fever, as I mentioned. The former just decided to stay put. And so Leonard and myself in our respective situations a century and some later are the result of those decisions made by people who at the time were far younger than we are now. Leonard uh, kindly invited Pam and me to come and stay with him uh, and his family in Odebro after my conference was done and, and to travel to the region of Dalslan to rediscover our common roots. Ingrid and Leonard are charming, generous, and fortunately for Pam and me, completely bilingual folks. They have raised three very fine sons, Oscar, the forestry expert, Linus, the police officer, and Victor, the cardiac nurse, all solid Swedish citizens. But I would have to say uh, that of the three, the forester would seem to have the most work to do in Sweden by a mile, based on my observations of that country and, and the need for forestry versus, uh, you know, people with heart problems and, and, uh, and people who break the law. We spent the day visiting different relatives' houses, churches, cemeteries, drinking a lot of coffee and eating wonderful food and talking about family history. We ended the day with a sunset boat ride on Lake Stora Lee and then took the car ferry over to a uh, country road leading to Leonard's ancestral lakeside farm on the Jardine side uh, where we spent the night. Now before we go any further let me just pause to express my deep admiration and affection for my newfound cousin Leonard. He would be amazing even without the farm and the lake and the 1966 Volvo that he starts up by spraying on the uh, engine. It has been standing for a while, so that's probably why it's a little bit. Now are today. Yeah, it's talking. And, uh... But then there's the fact that the guy just looks exactly like my grandfather Arvid. Now, any of you watching this video who knew Arvid, just look at this picture. Am I wrong about that? Look at the picture. I mean, it's just Arvid redivive us. And then it gets spookier when Leonard opens his mouth. My grandfather probably gave that to Carl then, his oldest son. And Carl is the father of Åke. And uh, Åke keeps this ring then. It's yeah. their, his yeah. wedding ring. Well, so it, was, it felt like touching history. Yeah. Now, as far as family history and roots rediscovery go, there's nothing like having an elderly relative who just knows everything and wants to talk about it and tell you about it, and that relative is Brigitte. I believe she is descended from the Andreasen branch, being a cousin of Leonard's mother, Elin, and I could be wrong about this, and I stand to be corrected by Leonard. But what I do know is that Brigitte is a wonderfully generous and engaging Swedish lady of a certain age. She's just brimming with information about the family 
And if only I could have understood Swedish, I would have gotten a lot more out of it. All I could do really was appreciate the music in it. And Swedish really does sound like singing to me. Uh, that, and I could look at the pictures in a truly amazing archive of local Nosa Mark history that Leonard calls the Big Red Book. You see it on the table there, next to the Swanson Family Book, which turns out to be a highly derivative of the Big Red Book. It's kind of like the Revised Standard Version to the King James Authoritative Volume. This might be a good time to explain the Swedish custom of the fika. A fika is referred to as a coffee break, but it's really I mean, that's a colossal understatement of what it is. It's basically a lot of great food in the middle of the morning and then again in the afternoon. This is a picture of the fika that was provided uh, at the Grand Central Hotel in Stockholm where I spoke at a small international conference. Uh, you get the idea. And uh, so I thought I knew what a fika was until we got to Brigitte's house. Now, Leonard had explained to me in advance that Brigitte would probably apologize for the meagerness of the snack that she would provide, but that this would stand in stark contrast to what we would actually receive, and that turned out to be right. And it also gave me a whole new insight into the aunties and what they would serve to any guest, you remember this, uh, who showed up at any time of day at their little house in South Minneapolis. I had realized before that the aunties were wonderful and generous souls, but now in Sweden it dawned on me they were hardwired to do this. They probably couldn't help themselves, which is not to take anything away from them or the fact that they enjoyed going to funerals in their old age, commenting on the funeral food and taking Polaroids of their deceased friends in the casket, later to opine to a visitor that this was not the greatest picture of the friend in question, you know, she had looked better, but the food was always great. And those were the aunties, Olga and Agnes, and now I know firsthand where they were coming from. Now, one, one thing they have a lot of in Sweden is gorgeous churches, many of them dating back to the Middle Ages. You know, you're driving along the expressway, you pull off to refuel and just wander into a random medieval town with a church that looks like this. It's just beautiful, unfortunately, or not, depending on your point of view, this is not the kind of church my people in Sweden were into. They thought of churches like this as just kind of too much church and not enough personal piety. So they trimmed away the liturgical foliage obstructing their personal connection to God and started churches that looked like this. And now this is a special place. Yeah, this is that, the Covenant that, Church. Exactly. And this building was built 1888. And here you see the same building then from the Big Red Book. From the Big Red Book. And, this uh, and it's that. taken 1930 or something like mm -hmm. that. Now, if you're into simple and spare and the essence of the gospel has lived out in providing amazing fikas to strangers from the States, you'll just love the Covenant Church in Sweden. We ended the afternoon at the Lakeside family home now occupied by Leonard's first cousin, Stefan, my third cousin, uh, who cooked a wonderful barbecue supper for us all to share. At the end of the day, Pam and I went with Leonard to stay overnight at his farm near Banksford. It is, uh, it's a place. Oscar's moose hunt tower <laughs> with an own stove. It's like eater in it. <laughs> you sit there and watch oh, that's funny. deers and yeah. yeah. There's no highway, but there is a road though. We, we used to go here with a tractor and a carrier, and then we put all the kids there and all stuff and go down here and swim and stay here. And it's good weather. They like to stay down here all day. See, this is much smaller compared to Stora Ledan, but then... Uh... Ford. Yes. Very fun. Do you do it? Yeah, the yeah. boys does. That's a big sport. Um, everywhere. Everywhere there's water. Paddle boarding. Yeah. What's the name of, what is the name of this lake, Leonard? Askifer. Sweden has great modern uh, infrastructure, beautiful litter-free highways. Uh. Hey, driver. Hey, yo. Just an hour to Stockholm. The 
you go to Orlando Airport in Stockholm and you think you're looking at this really attractive modern air traffic control tower, but then you keep watching it and all of a sudden you realize it's just a Norwegian air shuttle taking off on a flight to Oslo. Pam and I uh, ended our stay with a night at the Christina Hotel in Stockholm and a boat tour of the archipelagos. Oh, and dinner in the Gamlastad, the old town with narrow cobblestone streets, you know, you back home, if you cook something for dinner, it might be meat and potatoes. And when you go out to a nice restaurant, we might have something like baked trout. Here in Sweden, Ingrid and Leonard served us wonderful baked salmon in, in their home, and so we went out to a restaurant in Stockholm on our last night and ordered the tourist special, Swedish meatballs and mashed potatoes. I'm sure they serve this to people like us who have been to Ikea or they just remember their aunties and they come to Sweden longing for their food. It was delicious. This is the place where they settled down. Maria Lisa Anders' daughter and Nils Nilsson then as a married couple. And it's called Galterud, not far away from the Lutheran church. And uh, we, we think that she got eight children here mm. and uh, four of them died. And uh, then even her husband Nils Nilsson died. And all in a sudden she was not allowed to stay any longer here because one of Nils' brother should take over the property and he and his family should live there. So she had to so she go had back. To leave. Yeah, she had to leave with those four kids. Here we are then to the next place where Maria Lisa had to move. And then the congregation or the people in the congregation decided to help her to build up a small house where she could live with her four kids. And this is called Semb. So we went to Bergerud and that's where Johannes Swanson came from then. And Birgit, she was very... Angry. She was really happy to see it. Yes, yeah. I think that was the first time even for her to see this yeah. ground. And that's a building from the late 1700. And that's where your great-grandparents married. And we wanted to actually see the church at sunset, but the sun was shining in our eyes. But you can see the outline of it there. Downtown Nosy Market. Yeah, downtown Nosy. Metropolitan Nosy Market, yes. which is quite a bustling place. This is Oriel Dahlstrom. He was the man who went to Chicago and New York and worked on big construction. They say he worked on the Empire State Building. And then he, he lost his wife over there and came back and married Ingeborg Dahlstrom, the daughter of Bulette then. One of the sisters. One of the sisters. Yeah. It's over her husband then, John, who died far too early. 1998, only 57 years old. He was a policeman in this area. And the, the nice thing is that Birgit had thought further on here because I'm pointing at two doves that is leaving this earth and that is symbolizing John and herself. And then you can see the trees on the gravestone. And Three of the trees symbolize her three boys, mm -hmm. and from the ground there are coming up grass, and that is symbolizing the seven great children she has nowadays. Well, this is the house where Arvid came then in the late 60s and met Arvid and Ingeborg Dahlström. And we think because Arvid was so good at English, he was the one who could host. And uh, this is called a Rygstö, and it's on this property, the red house is where Johannes and Maria left for the States to, yes. That's um, not Arvid Swanson, but... Uh, <laughs> well, there's a picture in the white book of Arvid pointing off to Dora Lee in an imaginative pose, and so I wanted to try to recap that. It's not the same spot, but it's the same lake. Same blood. The same